Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Rick Hansen and this is The Loving Brain. I'm very, very pleased to have with us today uh, my friend and really, truly internationally recognized uh, expert on parenting and family life, Dr. Christine Carter, uh, who is a former executive director of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Uh, she's the author of Raising Happiness, a bestseller, 10 Simple Steps for More Joyful Kids and Happier Parents. Uh, Christine coaches and teaches online classes uh, to help parents and even prospective parents, I suspect, bring more joy into their own lives and the lives of their children. Um, she also writes an award-winning blog for parents and couples. Uh, she's a sociologist and a happiness expert, uh, and as I said, uh, very strongly affiliated with UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. Uh, you can find out more about Dr. Carter at christinecarter.com. Christine, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Carter.com. Lots of freely offered resources there, as well as information about her uh, courses, which are very uh, accessible to people and chock full of great value. Uh, I've known Christine for quite a while. She's full of life, has an extraordinary laugh, uh, and she's talking with us today from her home office. And I hope that from time to time, will be visited by her elderly dog in the background. Uh -huh. So, Christine, very, very glad to have you here with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Rick. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, that's great. So, to dive in, um, I'll start with a question I routinely ask everybody uh, at the beginning here. Why has it been important to you personally to become more skillful in your relationships? Well, like, like many people, I think my relationships are my primary source of happiness. Mm. And uh, by happiness, I just mean positive emotions in general. You know, when I feel um, love or compassion, it's usually coming from, of course, my relationships. Now, now, what's interesting for me as a sociologist, when you look at the last 100, maybe even 200 years of uh, research on happiness, on what makes people happy, the most common finding, the most solid finding, I think, too, is, is that a person's happiness is best predicted by their connections to other people, by the breadth and the depth of their social ties. Mm. So um, it's both professional and personal <laughs> for me. Um, finding joy in my relationships is equal to finding joy in my life. Right. That's great. And um, I'm actually going to diverge a little to just kind of talk a bit about what you just said right there, which is a very common uh, statement these days. And so um, this, I'm going to frame a question. So the way I want to frame it is to imagine a pie chart of causes of, yes. let's say, global well-being at, let's say, midlife, broadly defined. Okay. okay. So we have <laughs> the pie chart of causes of average well-being at, let's say, midlife. Okay? Uh -huh. okay. And we recognize, very important point, that that average pie chart of causes will be different for different individuals. Right. And research data is about the average pie chart of causes. Okay. Now you just talked about the slice of the pie of causes of global well-being that's about one's relationships. Yeah. Distinct from things like physical health, social class, intelligence, luck, personality factors, athletic ability, all the rest. Okay. <laughs> If you were to ballpark it, how big do you think, on average, the slice of the pie is that has to do with relationships of all kinds in terms of the outcome of, let's say, global well-being in midlife? Well, you know what? I think that you can't divide it into pie. I'm going to reframe it because it's so, it's, the slice of the pie is so large that um, it's, it's better to think of it as a Venn diagram because if you think about your relationships affect all those other things mm. or are affected by all those other things, right? Mm -hmm. So your relationships affect your physical health. Your socioeconomic status affects your, the types of relationships you have and how stressful or rewarding they, they are. Yes. Um, you, your neighborhood affects your relationships. What were some of the other things that you just mentioned? that could go into it. Oh, uh, athletic ability, creative talent, yeah. appearance, so, luck, so, social class. Right, right. Your appearance. Uh, you know, all of these things don't overlap 100%, but they overlap quite a lot. They, they're all, it's a pretty dynamic 
um, thing. And so that's, I think, why relationships are in part so powerful. I mean, we are such a clannish tribal species, right? Right. You know, and we are so connected to our people. And um, sociologically, our, you know, our modern society is tends towards the individual, which is, is in my mind, a kind of an unnatural state for right. us biologically. To go back to your Venn diagram now, again, the pie chart of causes, <laughs> um, it's a two-way street. I mean, you're making right. the point that relationship factors in that slice of the pie actually co-vary with or influence other factors like, let's say, lifetime earnings or exactly. Exactly. willingness to do healthy thing. practices. But of course, it goes the other way too. You yes. know, lifetime earnings might make you feel more confident in your relationships. Uh, good health practices they might make you more appealing. Yeah, exactly. To so people. it's, a, it's yes. an important they point. Go, absolutely, they go both ways. Yeah. Absolutely. So important point number one. Important point number two. What do you think about the possibility that sometimes people generalize from their own psychology? to the population, including doing this as experts or academics, because people who shall be nameless, I've known very introverted experts who tended to minimize the impact of the relationship slice of the pie of causes. Uh -huh. On the other hand, I've known people who are very extroverted, who really talk about how important relationships are overall. And I think it's important from a kind of diversity standpoint to enable people who are more introverted to still feel okay about themselves if honestly relationships are important, but they're not the great bulk of their personal pie of what makes them happy. Yeah. Whereas for a different person, wow, relationships are everything. And both of those right. people are normal and perfectly good. So what yeah. do you think about this kind of point I'm making? I, I, think, that, I think that's a really important point and I think it's important too to to um, realize that just because I think that the part the slice of the pie is quite big or that it influences a lot of things, that does not mean that quantity is everything or mm. even extroversion is everything. Mm. But the, and what I'm trying to say is really influential is the strength of your sense of connectedness, mm. and so your um, underlying felt sense, kind of in the your background in your being, underlying felt sense of being a part of something larger than yourself. And usually, for most people, that's relationships with other people, being a part of a family, um, or a sense of a family, whether or not they're actually blood relations, right? So they could be connected in some other chosen kind of family way. Now, there are people who get that sense of connectedness, that strong, felt sense of a tie to nature, right? or to um, a spiritual god or uh, mm. pra through that type of practice. So it doesn't always come through relationships with other people. It's just, I think, most often it does. And certainly because we are all born into families, mm. that is a, our first place that we feel like we are a part of something larger than ourselves, that we are connected, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, people's relationship with gods, God or a you know spiritual being, notwithstanding, I'm talking about yeah. a more practical sense. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to talking with you about is your expertise about family life. Um, just before we go there, again, a question I routinely ask people uh, in this series, this program, if you don't mind saying, and as openly as you care to, uh, what's a relationship issue you've personally grappled with and what have you learned about dealing with it that might be of general value to others? Okay, well, I have learned a lot on this and sometimes I'm accused of oversharing, but I, I'll just tell you everything. No, I am divorced. And so um, I think that that uh, and that is um, an experience, a relationship experience of having I was married for 10 years to a really wonderful guy and I still co-parent with that um, person and now I'm in a new relationship and have been for about half as long as I was married. And the interesting thing about that is, um, well, I learned a lot from, from that pa very painful experience. And what I, what I learned that uh, I think is valuable for other people to know about is that, um, oh gosh, well, I learned so much, but the first thing that occurred to me when you asked that question is that you know that first marriage for me failed because 
I married somebody who was perfect for my mother, really, <laughs> you know? So he is a really wonderful guy, and he met every external measure for, of perfection it, as my parents themselves would out. Like, if they were going to choose somebody for me, that's exactly who they would choose. And, and this was not something I realized, um, that I was making a lot of decisions for myself based on what other people were, would have for me, right? And so, you know, I'm lucky because what I would choose for myself and what my parents would choose for me, um, clearly I got married pretty young, um, it was not that different. But it's interesting, it's different enough, right? So that as I, you know, w you know grew up when I yeah. turned 30, and I didn't get divorced until I was 35, but I have, um, you know, you learn who you are and what you want in the world. And uh, I think it's really important to make choices, as particularly related to intimate relationships, yeah. based on your own sense of self and not yeah. other people's sense of We're having some uh, work done on the open space outside my home here. So, just Oh, I thought you were going to tell me a story about your wife. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, that kind of door. No, no. Door. <laughs> well, we're being recorded, really, so can watch can't do that. This later, Rick. Well, to sum up, though, you're talking about. A takeaway being, one, be aware of the standards of your own parents or the messages or the examples in your own head, and then sort out wheat from the chaff, at least as far as you're concerned. You know, what's yeah. useful and what's not useful. And then I guess when you realize that maybe you've gone down a road that isn't the best possible road for yourself and for all concerned, have the courage to do something about it, or at least yeah. evaluate your options in a very, very open and clear-headed way. Okay, great. Well, um, is that okay? Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That it, and you know, I mean, the other thing is that it, it's, I'm in a wonderful relationship now and my relationship with my former husband has simply been, been transformed to yeah. something that is um, more workable for us both. And so it's not all, you know, sometimes we have such painful things that happen to us in our relationships, yeah. but that those can just be the seeds for growth, right? Yeah. That, that every relationship that we have is the potential to be so much better than the last one. That's um, great. Because we learn so much yeah. from them. That's great. Okay. Well, uh, in that hopeful context, uh, <laughs> I want to dive now into, uh, you know, when the nightmare begins, when kids arrive, uh, and uh, oh, when the dream begins, yeah, we live the dream. Right? What I mean by that, and I'm, we're going to do this in looking at it two ways. In other words, um, one way to look at this is as a parent oneself, or someone who's thinking about becoming a parent, or entering into a relationship, maybe a blended family or a step parenting situation. Uh, even, uh, maybe a quite a non-traditional arrangement, uh, and thinking about what what happens to oneself uh, when kids arrive, uh, either to oneself or to one's partner, and then how does that reverberate out around in, in the larger system, including maybe involving siblings, older brothers, older sisters. So that's one way to look at it. That's sort of the adult perspective. Mm -hmm. The other perspective, of course, that can come out of this material is to look at it from the child perspective. In other words, as we understand as adults, some of the ways that having children affects parents, that can reverberate back and help us be more insightful and reflective about how we were affected as an infant or a toddler or a preschooler or a kid altogether by the way that we are impacted our own parents and our siblings, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to keep both these perspectives in mind um, as we talk through this here. So. Okay. Right? In that context, then, what are some of the main things to be aware of when people think about what children arriving does to a parent, uh, a mother or a father, to a couple, and to a family system altogether? Well, the main thing to be aware of is that everything changes, that it's really a massive metamorphosis. And I, I like the word metamorphosis in the sense that um, 
because it comes, I think, originally from the caterpillar and the butterfly. And I normally, um, what, I, what I like to tell parents is like, when you think about the caterpillar going into its chrysalis, which is not really so much the pregnancy as it is like the first year of your first child's birth, right? What the caterpillar doesn't like go into its chrysalis and slowly grow little butterfly legs and slowly grow wings. It completely breaks down. If you were gonna break open that chrysalis, it's just a bunch of gook, right? Like it's just, it's just a bunch of DNA. And that then it emerges slowly as this butterfly. And when it emerges as the butterfly too, we need to remember that the butterfly is quite weak and wet at first, mm. right? And eventually then it's able to fly. And so I like, to, I like parents to think about that. I mean, this is any major change in our lives, but I think that our culture doesn't really pay enough attention to what a huge um, metamorphosis becoming a parent really is. Yeah. That it is a complete, for most people, a complete and utter, utter breakdown. And by, by that I don't necessarily mean a nervous breakdown, although I've certainly known many women <laughs> and, and fathers alike, but it's, it completely changes your relationship to your other parent if you've got one. Um, it com completely changes your relationship to yourself, your own identity. You have this new relationship in your life, which I think for most parents uh, is the most powerful thing that they've ever experienced in terms of love. So then, then they're able to apply that new felt sense of this power of this incredible love of this little person realizing that, oh my gosh, I mean, I remember thinking, I, I love my husband so much more, right? Mm. Like I just had this incredibly huge sense of it. But, you know, I, I did not, I was not prepared for the way that everything, everything sort of broke down. And because I wasn't aware that everything was going to break down, um, I, it, that metamorphosis took a really long time for me to emerge from, for me personally. And this is something that I see a lot in a lot of parents that, um, you know, that, that nothing really stays the same. And um, it creates a lot of unmet expectations, which are a problem we should probably talk about. And... Um, what can you say what you mean? In other words, that as a parent, maybe you had a, a, a dream of how it would be, yeah, and then so, it turns out different? Yeah, so that you have these, you have, um, you have these actual experiences of how things work, and then you also have fantasies about how things will be. And maybe none of those things are happening anymore. So, you know, you might have had a really passionate relationship with your partner before you had a kid. And then that, the passion sort of starts to change. And your everything about, physically about the relationship starts to change, for example. And maybe you had um, expectations that your partner would be different with your children than they are, mm -hmm. um, or that they would be different towards you than they are. Yeah. And, um, and so that sort of, um, those expectations that, which then become unmet create a lot of disappointment. And so I'm always looking for, you know, what types of emotions are habitually evoked mm -hmm. in any sort of relationship. You know, you get into daily habits and patterns with people and there are uh, certain emotions which become very habitual. Mm -hmm. And if you're operating, you know, uh, with a set of expectations which are routinely unmet, then you're gonna be routinely feeling frustrated, routinely feeling disappointed. Those are kind of not the right, not, I shouldn't say not the right, but those are, those are not positive emotions, you know, that aren't going to build the relationship. And I feel like it's a little bit like driving around San Francisco with a map of Seattle, right? You might have a really good map of Seattle, right? Your expectations might be wonder, your fantasy might be beautiful, but it's just a fantasy and it's not because it's not the right map. It's not, it's not getting you where you want to get because you happen to be in San Francisco. Yeah. And that, that um, sort of this um that sort of disjointed i don't i don't know what i'm trying to say here but you see what i you see oh what I'm you're, you're yeah. incredibly articulate um <laughs> a little bit later we're going to get more into the practical side of it but since this is so alive right now let's go here <laughs> so okay so now let's suppose you have parents um a, a woman a man same gender couple heterosexual couple whatever right they have expectations they have hopes they have dreams 
Yes. Uh, you may know the phrase, you probably do, Selma Freiberg's line about ghosts in the nursery. These yeah. fantasies from childhood or young adulthood that are alive in the mind of the parent as he or she is doing uh, this caring for children. And of course, having a little kid evokes feelings and memories and unconscious desires and yeah. viewpoints and expectations ourselves from when we were little kids. Just yes. the smell of the nursery, you know, the feeling of soft flannel on your cheek, all that stuff really stirs up the so-called ghosts in the nursery. Okay, yes. so we have someone who's um, got these expectations and is experiencing disappointment, maybe disappointment in a partner, maybe even disappointment in, in oneself. Themselves. You know, yes. feeling guilty, right. falling short. Okay, doctor, what can a person do about this for themselves? Well, there's a lot of things that we can do, and I think that that's the most important thing. But I, you know, to to stop and think about this as a as a major change, no matter where you are, right? Like, so it could be the transition from you know having to kindergarten for your kids, or um, to college, or what you know that there are, the whole thing about having kids is that it means constant change in your own identity, your own life, and in your relationships. So the first thing is to really get good at change. Um, mm. and, um, so that you know that you can handle sort of the next wave of things. Um, the, the second thing that I, I recommend people do a part of being good at change is being good at, at um, imagining consciously the way you'd like things to be. And this is, there's a little, there's a trick to not a trick, but there's a, it's a skill I think in terms of being able to put forth what it is you so you'd like to have happen. So you're in the you're in the chrysalis. It's a bunch of goop. You're in the middle of the change. You can't. You usually can't change it. It's uh, you, you can't can, usually can't control it. Like it's something that happens, right? You know, kids are born and the change is happening. And and aside from stopping the change from happening, right? What you can do from here on out is um, create your own butterfly, right? So um, the enzyme that creates the butterfly from the caterpillar is called imago um, or something like that, imago. It's not imago because that's the other relation, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's imago. Um, and, and I love that because it has the same root as the word imagine, right? So what I recommend that people do if they find themselves are constantly disappointed in their life in some way or they're frustrated by it or they're just not getting what they want, to sit and imagine. Now, what is, what's realistic here? Mm. What... Um, what is an expectation um, for me that, is, that, I, you know, that I am worthy of and that will make me happy? Now, this is, a, there's a, this is tricky. This can be sort of a sticky wicket in the sense that um, we, particularly with our relationships, because we expect too much of one other person. As mm -hmm. a society, as we've, our family unit has gotten smaller and smaller and we've become both more mobile and more mm -hmm. isolated in terms of our face-to-face -face, um, relationships, we um, put a lot on our partner to be um, our, you know, everything romantically, of course, but also, in, you know, from an intimate standpoint, psychologically, practically speaking, they need to help us, you know, when there are kids involved, um, to be the everybody, everything we live on, lean on in every way. And it's um, so I, where I just ask people to ask themselves, is that fair to expect that um, of another single human being? And um, how can you start to supplement with other relationships? It's not that you don't need you don't have those needs. It's that um, yeah. I think we need to supplement with our other relationships a little bit. Yeah. So a lot of the, you know, I always think about my grandmother who did not honestly have a marriage that I, I would want. So this is a little tricky for me to go back to, but she was always so happy. I never heard her complain about her husband. And honestly, my grandfather was a wonderful guy, but he fell short in my eyes in many ways. You know, I could see the things that she should be complaining about in my, should be complaining about in my mind. But you know, they, she, he was, she had minimal expectations of, of um, what he would fulfill in her life. You know, he was a great provider and socially they would go out and have fun together. They loved to dance together. And he was um, the father that she needed him to be and no more. That's the way she put it. 
Um, and, and then she had tons of friends, tons of friends. And, uh, and so she had this other very rich life that would not be acceptable to a lot of people in my generation. Mm. And yet she was happier in her relationship than a lot of uh, people in our generation are. So there's just something there. There's that irony, I think is fun for us to play with a little bit. Right. Um, you know, in other words, you're talking about be aware of your expectations, including ones that are maybe ghosts in your own personal nursery, yes. relics from yeah. your childhood that are not so useful today. Yeah. Uh, like you talked about uh, what was in your own mind from your family when you chose right. the person to be your first husband yeah. uh, and your only husband so far, yeah. uh, to my knowledge. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you're also talking about being willing, on the other hand, to have a dream and to identify what you do want at this point. So it becomes your North Star at this point, yeah. while also being aware of the pitfall of getting over attached to it as a new expectation right. and then something to be disappointed around. So, but still, you know, keeping, uh, throwing out the bathwater as it were, but keeping the baby of the value yeah. of the North Star. So that's really helpful. And yeah. then you're, to me, treading into some very delicate territory because there's a balance. I think you're exactly right. On the one hand, given that the so-called village it takes to raise a child mm -hmm. looks more like a ghost town much of the time these days. Oh, you as a sociologist know that, you know, of yeah. course, as our modern Western cultures have changed so much. So, yeah, it is natural, you know, when the village only has two people. And then if your partner is kind of AWOL in terms of the teamwork dimension of raising a family, right. uh, it's really a devastating experience. So on the one hand, to your, to your point, there can be a pitfall in over relying or over expecting one person to be a, to be the be all and end all and not realize that you need to shore up a network of support around yes. you so right. you don't have, have all your eggs in one basket. Right. On the other hand, uh, as a psychologist, and someone who's worked in parenting for quite a while, you know, our kids are 25 and 22. I've actually seen a situation very commonly that it's not that people ask too much of their partner after kids come along, it's that they feel too unentitled to ask for what's really appropriate. Aww. In other words, they don't feel entitled to ask for their partner to really step up around t teamwork issues yeah. so there's a genuine equity. Or flip yeah. the other way, they don't feel entitled to ask their partner to really step up in terms of intimate friendship uh, and not just, you know, treat oneself, let's say, as, you know, a kind of a co-parent, as it were, a co-mortgage holder, a, a co-dishes right. doer, rather right. than still an intimate friend. So yeah. I think we're getting at here the, the, the middle way, as it were, between not yeah. getting fixated on your partner doing everything for you, but on the other hand, having a very healthy sense of entitlement to get your legitimate needs met for your own sake, as yeah. well as for the sake of this child. Because right. if you start running on fumes, you don't have that, you're going to have less capacity to be the, the great mother or father that you really want to be and your child Absolutely. deserves you to be. Absolutely. And I, you know, you're bringing up a really good point that we might want to come back to later if you want to keep talking about this. But I think that sort of running on fumes thing is, is very real. And that uh, this generation of parents, or my generation of parents today, and, you know, maybe others before us, certainly others before us, have... Actually, I would say we're much more willing to put our kids' needs before our own. And I feel like the hierarchy of um, priorities now among our generation of parents is, you know, the kids' achievement needs first in terms of, like, what, what they need to be successful in school. And those are valid. I'm not saying they're not valid. But then, and then maybe the um, parents' um, achievement needs, really, you know, uh, is what we tend to focus on. And then maybe the relation the success of the relationship and i you know i think it's really important oh, to oh, there's a fourth you haven't mentioned it which is oh. really interesting one's own well-being oh right. and I, I yeah that's yes yes well I, that's kind of what i meant by the the second the second oh, okay great right yeah. you know i mean it's it's interesting i was talking it was like it's sort of like kids self relationship hmm. and and the focus is in the uh, the foci in those things tends to be around things not so much related to well-being mm. as success because that's mm. what our cl culture points us to mm. and what I'd like to do is 
change the order, the hierarchy a little bit, and also the focus in there. So I, I would put um, self and relationship uh, almost equal, maybe self first, but relationship really close there in terms of a hierarchy because the two things for most people who are particularly people who are married or in marriage-like relationships, right? Um, those, those things are very tied together, your well-being and the well-being of your partner and the well-being of your relationship, really. Um, and then kids, right? Mm -hmm. And what I really want, because we know as parents, you know this as well as anybody, right? That the, the, there are three reasons for that. One, when we are happy ourselves, and when we're in a happy relationship, it tends to influence our own happiness or our own overall well-being. Um, we're modeling what it takes to be happy in life, to, mm. ha to, to be, um, you know, to have meaning and fulfillment in life. And so it might be, you know, that you go out to dinner with your friends regularly or that you exercise or that you get enough sleep um, or whatever it takes for you personally. When you model that for your kids, you're, they're much more likely to... to find that themselves later in life, to prioritize those things later in life. We also know that for those positive emotions, that when we're um, doing well, we tend to parent quite different, differently than when we are stressed or running on fumes. So this is, I don't say this to make listeners anxious because I don't want people to feel anxious after hearing this, but just to, just to prioritize it, your own your own happiness really does matter quite a lot and that mm. um, it stress, um, how well uh, parents are managing stress tends to be as important as any other um, uh, parenting. It's the third most important parenting skill, which is really interesting because it's not, of course, a parenting skill. But when researchers look at all, all these sort of meta-analyses of what tends to influence kids' well-being, um, and that one of the things that emerges, you know what's really interesting, actually, two of the three top ten ones, the first one, two, and three, number one is, um, is around love and affection, right, as it should be. So if, you, if your parents, if you're, as a parent, you're very loving and affectionate, that tends to have a, to move the needle on your kid's happiness a lot. The number two thing is how skilled you are in your relationship with either your spouse or your ex-spouse, if that ex-spouse is a parent of your child. And the third thing is how well you manage stress. So two of the, those three things really have nothing to do with your child at all, and, um, or what direct interaction um, with your child. So all of that is to say that we parent really differently when we're not stressed or, and that when we're feeling happy. We tend to be warmer and more responsive. <laughs> We tend to be more um, consistent in our discipline. Um, we all know this. All of us who are parents know this from experience to be true, right? That we can we can feel that in our um, reactions. And then the third reason is that emotions are incredibly contagious, as you know. And mm. so, um, particularly for little kids, but also for just among adults, right? When we um, when we're angry, um, people around us, their heart rate will go up, their palms might start to sweat, they might start to feel anxious or angry themselves. And when we're happy, or feeling a sense of awe, awe is very contagious, um, or feeling a sense mm -hmm. of compassion or love, that spreads within our family unit. So that's why, that's a really long-winded answer, I'm sorry, Rick, mm -hmm. but that, that's why it's so, um, mm -hmm. so important for us to put our own needs um, first, and really, I'm talking about happiness needs, right? Or well be overall well being. Kind of, I looking at those what it takes to ha have a lot of positive emotions in our life, and to have a nice full full toolkit for coping with life's inevitable difficulties, so that we can be in that place of contentment or balance or or happiness, um, rather than just focusing on what it takes to get ahead at work or for our kids to succeed in school or whatever. Right. Our culture places all the focus on the, those achievement sort of, you know, objective measures of success kinds of right. things. And that follows. So that if follows. I'm a if I'm a parent now, uh, and I am a parent of course, but I mean I'm just imagining someone who so I want to create a situation as yeah. it someone who uh, just for convenience, let's say heterosexual couple, uh, they're a couple. Uh, they both are working, 
and they have demanding jobs that take time. Uh, they've got kids who are in, let's say, preschool or elementary age kids, two kids, let's say. They're busy, they're tired, uh, they're running around, their schedules are difficult. Uh, you and I are talking about the importance of taking care of oneself yeah. and uh, uh, filling up one's own cup and all the rest of that. Yeah, right. You know, in other words, what can a person do concretely? And let's also suppose that, uh, as often is the case, when two parents feel internally depleted and also, frankly, there's a slow accumulation of feeling let down by each other yeah, quite yeah. often. Right. So each parent tends to look to the other one for refueling. That other parent is already running on empty themselves and frankly is a little resentful for various yeah. reasons and not that excited about really extending themselves necessarily. And meanwhile, the kids are uh, just kids. And let's say the kids have real needs. You know, maybe one of them is struggling a little bit in school or one of them has a particularly sensitive temperament or real world stuff. Um, and it's all happening full speed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's real. It's real. What yes, concrete? You described a very, very real. I mean, I think that there are very few people that don't won't relate to that. Yeah, yeah. I've so, lived it and, <laughs> and all the rest. And I know you have too. So in, in the real, like people hear my well-intended advice, your well-meaning advice, the everybody's well-intended advice. Yeah, right. What do I actually do inside my mind? or with my mouth or with my body, because that's what yeah. I've got control over, basically. Mm -hmm. What do I do? What could I start doing today or this week to start turning this around, filling up my own cup and shifting my family? Because I can feel yeah. okay. that there's too much irritation. There's too much pressure. Right. The kids are starting to be the canaries in the mind who are noticing, you know, mom and dad are having secret thoughts about not being together all the way to the... <laughs> right golden years what can people do okay there there are all that we can do and the first thing i want to go back to the image that we were talking about earlier about sort of building a team right instead of just having the two of you the the first thing you need to do is go back to more a more old-fashioned way of raising kids so today um, we actually, despite how the fact that we work full time and are are super busy, we actually spend more time with our kids than they did than than mothers did in the '50s and early '60s. So think about that. We are actually spending a, a lot of time with our kids, a lot more than um, we used to, even before um, women routinely worked outside the home, or, or the majority of women did. So we lose the guilt. All of this is coming from my, you know, my work to raise happy kids. So my, I am going to tell you a bunch of things to, you know, sort of help make for happier parents, but I don't want people to feel guilty about that because this is really the best interest of the, the children as well. So, uh, so start thinking about you can, how you can build that team. Now, a lot of people I work with say, but my parents don't live close, but I don't have living parents, but, but, but. Christine, you mean the team outside the couple? Outside the couple. So you're co-captains of that team and you might have divided um, your duties in very set ways or expect to do half of everything however you decide to be co-captains figure out how you're going to be co-captains of that and then figure out who your team is so maybe it involves um, you know teachers or you know a paid caregiver or neighbors or and it, it is very uncomfortable uncomfortable for most people these days for ask to ask for help in the ways mm -hmm. that um, that I routinely coach people to do it. But you have to think about that old um, fashioned neighborhood where kids were mostly outside, um, you know, during the summer when the weather was nice, and mostly sort of running around in packs. And the neighborhood, you know, I actually when I was first starting to think about this. My neighbor who lives next door, she's 82 now, and she's lived in this neighborhood for pretty much her whole life. And she is wonderful to go talk to, and I think very inspiring to, is to go talk to somebody who's lived in your neighborhood for a really long time. Mm. What did it used to be like to really get a sense of how there was a net of people raising these children 
and supporting you as a parent. So um, one thing that I like to have people do is, um, is create little favor circles and, and to just ask people who are kind of in your neighborhood or in, go who other parents at your kids' school or maybe go to your um, church or whatever little communities you have, however detached you may be um, from those communities, to think of, like, who could you do a little five-minute favor for? Mm-hmm. And who could be there to do a five-minute favor for you? And to just start to cultivate those kinds of relationships. So this is not a quick fix. Um, this is the longer-term fix to think about, like, who could you reach out to? So that you have five people. I'd like parents to have five people that they know that they can go to if, you know, a kid breaks their arm and they need to take the other one to... What you know what I mean? There are all these situations. Having been a single parent for a while, I, I have probably more than five people, um, but I've got their, them all sort of in my back pocket. Who can I call to pick my kids up from school if I'm running late? Who can I, you know, to just know that you have that practical help creates, takes some pressure off of you on a, from a day-to-day standpoint, but also a lot of psychological pressure um, can be released that way. The quick fix, the short-term fix, I think, you know, you think over the long-term, build your team, right, so that there's not so much pressure. You still get to be co-captains together, but you got to have a team to really help you play the game. The the quicker fix is to make sure that you have a lot of um, playtime with your co-captain and and with, with kids and without the kids. So think back, look, at, look for bright spots. When was the last time? Because people are terrible at predicting what will make them happy, um, So generally speaking. So I, ask, I like people to look back at something recent. You know, when was the last time that um, you felt really in love with your partner? And what were you doing? Usually you were doing something novel. I'll give you that clue, right? So, um, so how can you kind of recreate that situation? So it's... Um, you know, parents are like, oh, I know, I know I should have date night, but I'm so tired and I, what I really need is to sleep. And so take a nap and then go do something with your partner without the kids that, you know, maybe you went dancing last time and it was really, really fun or go just do something new. Um, anytime you can introduce some sort of element of risk, um, it's going to give you just a little hit of adrenaline um, that will make you feel a little weak in the knees like you used to. I mean, this is like we can create these situations that make our relationships feel fresh and give us a, give us a, a chance to really um, connect. What would be an example of risk? Well, you know, I, I brought up the dancing thing. It, it, for, um, for me, I'm not, I'm not, I like to dance, but I was, I'm not really very confident about my ability to do Latin dances, shall we put it that way? <laughs> and so when when uh, my fiance and I went out to um, to do that, there was an incredible era, you know, feeling of risk for me. I felt kind of like I was on the edge of making a total fool of myself, which there's something interesting about that because that's kind of how you feel when you're on a first or second date, right? Like there, you're on that edge. And so to recreate that, it actually just, biologically kind of recreates it for you so you sort of feel that Hmm. sense of and also we're really primed towards to really like novel situations so it's not like go to the same restaurant you always go to because you're tired and it's comfortable and it's easy Hmm. but to push yourself out of that so you're talking about feeding the couple here yes i'm talking about feeding the couple you also and you know the other the other risk that um people sometimes forget about is is um taking intimate risks that you know, what, when you're on a first date, basically every question you ask your partner or, or that is asked of you is potentially risky, right? That yeah. you know you're trying to re- you're revealing information that they don't know, and you may or may not make a good impression. Or, or so to try and just um, you know, we have those table topics for couples, and Mark always rolls his eyes when he sees them come out. You know, we'll be out to dinner, and I'll pull out a. Mark's your topic. fiance, yeah. and the table yes. topics are some kind of what game or something. Yes, it's a table topics are they have them for all different types of family groups, and there's one for couples, and it's just questions on cards, right? Something people could buy, let's say, or get. Yes, yes. Tabletop. Amazon.com, 1999, right? You know, it is sort of like... Great, and that's it, practical. And they're, great, they're great little conversation starters that um, 
that often ask you to, I mean, they're not, they're not questions that, that it's not information that we already know about each other necessarily, which is fun and surprising. So feeding the couple that way by really carving out time without your kids. And I know that you want to see your kids more, but your kids will be better off um, if you have time without them. But I also think families need to carve out, look for the bright spots um, in their family life and, and just play together too. What if you're mad at your partner and the prospect of being out to dinner is not very exciting? Well, I don't know. You're the therapist. You should <laughs> say what to do. What I would answer, how I would answer that is to say I would um, try and work it out in the morning. So say you, you know, you've fought on, on Friday and you have a date night on Saturday night. I would try and work it out Saturday morning, right? And then move on um, to just have a, ha carve out that date night um, as like, this is just time that we're going to play. We're but not what if try and solve big problems? Yeah, but I don't mean couples that are literally violent with each other. And obviously, oh, no. just for the yeah. record, if there's anything like that or possibility of it, of course, yeah. one should be very careful and get professional help first before doing anything, etc. But more of a common situation where uh, there's just been a slow accumulation. You know, the death of a thousand paper cuts, uh, feeling let down by each other in terms of being teammates or intimate friends, differences grow after kids come along, uh, the years go by, and there's a kind of, let's say, uh, quite common, a distance, uh, and even honestly a sense of grievances uh, that are managed but are very easy to trigger. In that quite common situation, Christine, what would you advise people in terms of your larger point about how to concretely, you know, turn the family around. Right. Well, I would advise people to get therapy, right? To heal, to try and heal that. Those. Let's say they can't or won't. They can't afford it. They won't do it. One person takes I, two to go to therapy. Know, yeah, definitely. I, you know, I they're not. They're not in is, divorce court, but they're. You know, they're in yeah, the yellow, if not distant. orange, zone. Yeah. So it, the real question is, can you build a bridge back? Yeah, right? how to do that. And they want the to, they that. don't want to get a divorce for many reasons. What can they do concretely that you would advise? I don't know. You know, I think we're kind of out, out of my realm of, uh, of expertise here. I, mm -hmm. You know, I think like looking for little positive ways to reconnect. So, you know, and, and that, depending on the situation, I totally acknowledge that that might not be enough. But I, I tend to just try and shift people's perspective on things. So it's very common, for example, for, you know, for somebody, something that you were really attracted to in somebody, particularly if they have a strong personality, to then be very annoyed by that, that same thing. It's, it's commonplace to have you know, somebody who you loved or were attracted to because they were the life of the party to suddenly be you know, their, their sort of extrovertedness is extremely annoying to you later, right? <laughs> So, I mean, this is common, but it also creates that sort of distance that, you know, pe you grow and change and grow apart. And the question is, can you can you grow back together? Yeah. Or, um, you know, I obviously was in a relationship in which I, did, I didn't feel that I could, I could heal it. So yeah. um, now it's interesting because I don't feel like I, could, I would let that happen um, necessarily again. I have enough tools. The, yeah. the, and I can watch these common things sort of start to happen. So what I mean by that shift in perspective, um, a lot of times the shift from annoyance um, to uh, acceptance can come from gratitude. So our brains, as you know, are like giant filters for information, and they will track um, or take in what we pay, put our attention on. And um, it's, it's a lot easier to put our attention on, on the things that annoy us for a lot of reasons that you mm -hmm. explained very well in a lot of your work. Um, but we can consciously um, focus on what we feel grateful for in the right. other person. And yeah. then that starts to build those connections again. So, you know, finding ways to play with them, finding ways to build an intimacy, to really 
um, get to know them again, yeah. acknowledging that they are a completely different person. Yeah. Ways to accept the things that annoy you um, by uh, l- instead of looking at what annoys you by what you feel grateful for. Yeah. Now, you know, I think that, that the gratitude practice, a daily gratitude practice is actually a really important one to have mm. um, in a romantic relationship. And, you know, Mark thought that this was really cheesy when I first you know, presented this to him as something that we would do. And I often do it, um, and at first did it kind of on the sly, like I was just slipping it in and he thought I was very sort of sappy and romantic. But I try never to end a day without telling him something um, that I'm grateful for about him, either something that he did and, um, Mm -hmm. and then tying it back to something larger about who he is. There's research shows that that makes it slightly more effective. So instead of saying, thank you for taking out the trash, saying, you know, I really appreciate that you took out the trash. You're such a thoughtful guy. You could see that I really didn't want to do that or something. Do you see what I'm saying? Like you tied in character strength instead of just a momentary lapse of being a jerk. (laughs) So we have around 10-ish minutes left. uh, So I want to definitely get into, um, to build on what you're saying. And so to make a point, I'm sure you, is implicit in what you said by being grateful for various things in your partner that does not mean waiving your own rights around getting your own needs met and one thing i've honestly seen myself a lot in this fairly common couple situation we're talking about where they're not really ready for divorce court but it's not a good place right now um, is to actually focus on making agreements with each other that they truly keep and use that as a structure for resolving issues. Uh, One person wants housework to be done differently. What could we actually agree about that and ideally resolve and put behind us? All right, right. one person wants to make love at least once a week without it being a big deal. Uh, Can we talk about that? Can we talk about what needs to happen for that to be really comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Can we, Mm -hmm. can we, build, in other words, in substantive ways, in addition to recognizing and being grateful about, you know, these really beautiful qualities in the other person. Yeah. Okay, so I want to ask you about kids. Okay, can I just say one more thing about that, that I think is really important, not that I don't want to be lost, is that those agreements, I think that I think you're totally right, those agreements are really important. But it's very hard to make an agreement with somebody that you're harboring ill will towards or that you feel a lot of friction and resentment. And that there is a very real um, phenomenon about sort of relationships and ratios of positive experiences to negative experiences. Oh, yeah. And so that if, you know, uh, if you're having a lot of negative experiences and then you're trying to have this neutral or positive experience where you make an agreement, you're just not going to be as high functioning as co-captains, right? Um, in this uh, sense, yeah. we know that psychologically it's very hard to, um, to, to make those kinds of agreements with somebody if you're having lots and lots of negative experiences with them. And so but- to really try to, to be- seed your relationship with positive experiences as well. That's not to ignore that you need to make these agreements and that you need to get this other stuff done, but that it's very functional to watch a comedy together where you're both laughing and to um, go do things together that you think are fun. It's not saying that it's not gonna make those other things go away. It's gonna make you more effective in that negotiation, less defensive, more, you know, that that we have to build those positive things in. I think both things are true, but I think it's also true that very often people have a lot of negative experiences and lack positive ones because they they are truly let down by their partner a lot. Yeah. Yes. And that needs to be addressed or they're talked to or dealt with uh, in ways that are really irritating or, or hurtful or their partner uh, is parenting in ways that are problematic or they disagree with each other. So I guess the way we would both talk about it here is that the two go together. As you come more together as teammates, yeah. uh, you can come more together as friends. As you come more together as friends, you can come together better as teammates right. in a positive cycle. And one thing that showed up for me, especially when our kids were young, is I realized that one of the best things I could do for myself was to figure out what it was that was bugging my wife about me and resolve it. 
Let's and get to right. the bottom of it and unilaterally be prepared over here to decide what was reasonable and what I just couldn't go with. And to relentlessly just kind of zero out her complaints, uh, yeah. not out of being a doormat, but out of realizing that this was a very powerful, proactive, self-caring strategy for myself, as well as obviously good for her, because I loved her, and good yeah. for our kids. But that stance of, I call it uh, unilateral virtue, where you just decide to zero in on the maximum reasonable bit in what the other person wants, and try to figure it out and deliver it, you know, and then that puts you, among other benefits, on the moral high ground after a while, where you're in a lot stronger position to ask for good treatment in return. Yeah. Um, and I've seen that as a really good path uh, for couples. For one, it takes you out of that Mexican standoff where each party is waiting for the right. other person to right. be a better partner or better parent or do more yeah. dishes or be more romantic, whatever. And then they're just in a standstill. But if you focus on, okay, unilaterally, what can I do about your issues with me? Because I'm pretty clear about what your issues are with me, you know? You've told yeah. me often enough, gosh darn it, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And then just go after it. Uh, it's a very effective way to break the log jam and to feel at cause rather than at effect, which has also, as you know, a lot of other benefits. So Yeah. Oh, uh, I think that's really lovely. I, I think that that is it's really lovely and a, a nice thing for people to remember. Yeah. Well, yeah. kids, all right? Remember kids. them? Anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, in things. our remaining minutes here, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about how to help children really by uh, creating, as it were, you know, the village that raises the child and making that village as good as possible, including mm -hmm. the co-captains of the village. Yeah. That's going to totally help kids. That's great. In addition to that, do you have any kind of last words here about uh, things people can do to raise happier children? Well, since I wrote a whole book on raising happy children, I have uh, generally lots of ideas. But I, you know, I think that um, the most important thing that parents can do really is to start with themselves. And we've talked a lot about that. But to really dive in and take care, thinking about what what do you need to be happy yourself, and taking care of of that is really the most important thing. I know, I mean, so let's, I, we've talked about that. Let's say you're doing that. Okay. Okay. Um, now, how about uh, helping our kids directly in the way we interact with them uh, to help them become happier? I mean, you are quite extraordinary about this. I'm not going to let you off the hook here. And you're a great mom as well as a great teacher of parents. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I think, um, I think what... These days, one of the most important things that parents can do that they don't typically do, this is counterintuitive, um, is um, to let their kids fail, right? That we are, it's really counterintuitive because we, as parents, are, I think, innately built to protect our children from everything, right? From pain, their own pain, other people's pain, um, from any sort of mistake making, but that our, our generation has really gone overboard in this. And... Um, and it's it's creating a generation of very brittle kids. Mm. So we we're seeing rates of ang clinical levels of anxiety and depression are really um, increasing um, in in our kids. And so and one of the things one of the reasons is that we are so focused on achievement and um, our focus on achievement, which is not really parents' fault, right? This is, this is a cultural thing that um, has a lot of causes, one of which is the, just the elite college application process right now has, is lots of sort of weird structural things like the advent of the internet has you know, created a situation in which um, hundreds and thousands of times more applicants are applying to the same number of colleges or the same spots, right? So it's just become very competitive for lots of structural reasons, right? It doesn't, if we, we're not even getting into the cultural reasons. Anyway, as a culture, we tend to be very, very focused on kids' achievement. And, and, um, and so we don't, we don't want them to make mistakes, and we, we don't want them to get a B ever, right? Because they, you know, parents have sort of honed in on making their kids, giving them the competitive edge. And this is doing a few things to kids' happiness besides just creating a lot of stress for them, right? That, that puts them under a lot of pressure. A lot of kids feel a lot of stress and different stresses at different ends of the socioeconomic um, scale, but not even talking about that. 
Um, okay, so when we protect our kids from failure or mistakes or even their own uncomfortable emotions, um, basically we're telling them that those that making a mistake must be really horrible mm-hmm. or, or having a failure must be a really terrible thing or having a difficult emotion like being afraid must be um, a really horrible thing or my parents wouldn't be sort of stepping in on these situations so much. And the second thing that we're teaching them when we do that is that um, that they must not be able to cope on their own with these difficult situations. And they're right. They don't, they aren't learning to cope on their own because they haven't, there aren't, they, for the most part, aren't being given the chance to do so. And then the third, the third thing that kids are learning is that they are entitled to a life free from difficulty um, or free from difficult emotions or from mistakes. And of course, nobody is entitled to a life free from difficulty. Yeah. And uh, it's not even possible, right? One of the things about that it takes to be a happy person is we need to know how to cope with life's inevitable difficulties. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and to be successful, we need to be able to embrace challenge without um, fear of uh, the repercussions if we fail. Mm-hmm. And so if we want our children to be happy in life, we need to not snowplow parent. Is, you know, we need to not clear the obstacles out of their way, but rather step aside and let them run head on into those obstacles and then pick themselves up. And, you know, we can, we can be there on the sidelines cheering for them, right? Maybe if they pull out and come and ask us for strategies, we can provide, you know, te- we can teach them how to cope themselves in the face of those difficulties. Mm. But, you know, we don't think about compassion um, as being a positive emotion. And I think about having a happy childhood as, have, as being as, as one that's, you know, full of a lot of different positive emotions and then the ability to deal with these difficulties. Mm. And I think when we shield kids from their own suffering and from the suffering of others, we're also shielding them from experiencing the most powerful positive emotion we have, which in my mind is compassion, right? Mm-hmm. So if you, if you don't let people experience their own suffering, they, they can't relate to other people when they're suffering. They can't feel a self-compassion. Uh, yeah. and, they, and they don't, and if we shield them from other people's suffering, then, um, then mm-hmm. they can never experience compassion for them. So it, it's kind That's of very beautiful, counterintuitive. The way you're tying that together. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. No, it's very... great. Just feeling that for the moment that enabling these children whom we love dearly yeah. to suffer helps them, um, strengthens them in various ways and all that, but also helps them become more compassionate toward the suffering of others because they've had some feeling for it themselves. Right. Yeah. Well, Christine, we're moving to the end here. I want to ask you if I could. Um, what's a growing edge for you these days in your relationships? How are you? What are you working on these days? What am I working on? Well, I'm, um, I'm working on in my relationships with my children. So I'm going to answer my children and with my romantic partners. That sound good to you? Um, it, in my relationships with my, well, with everybody, really, I'm, I'm working on what I think of as leading from behind. And that, I mean, in the, when you're trying to lead a horse, there's a metaphor here, when you're um, trying to lead a horse, so say you've got a horse in a round pen, um, and you want the horse to just circle you. If you get out ahead of the horse too much, it will stop and turn around. It thinks that that's what you want, even an untrained horse, that's mm-hmm. just their sense. And I think people are much the same. If you kind of stay behind them a little bit, that uh, I'm a very bossy person, and um, naturally. And um, so, what I'm working on in my relationships is um, not being so controlling, right? Not not being so bossy. And to me, I think of that horse that if I get too far in front, it causes you know kids to turn around, and but also. It makes Mark turn around too, right? I think other our adults too. Nobody likes to be bossed around. Nobody likes to, you know, when you, for me, I have a pretty forceful um, way about me, shall we say. So, so really I've answered it. That's what, that's what I'm working on right now. That's great. Thank Being you for Being more that. effective in my, in my parenting and also in my relationship and influencing people by, um, yeah. through less force. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> and then uh, I, I've known you quite a while, as you know, yeah. and uh, I have not experienced you as bossy, by the way. Oh, but good. I can I'm imagine so it. I can imagine it. <laughs> um, so, last question here. Uh, you know, looking out at the world, like for example, you you teach these online courses. You've had thousands of people come through your courses. You've traveled a lot. Uh, you you see the world. You read the paper and all the rest of that. Um, looking out at, at the world at large, right? Seven billion human beings, two thousand and thirteen. Uh, if there were one thing, one, just one, that uh, a critical mass of people worldwide. 10 million, 100 million, a billion, 5 billion, pick your number. If there were one thing that a critical mass of people worldwide did every day in terms of something they thought or spoke or did that didn't take very long, took at most a few minutes a day, uh, maybe even spread out over the course of a day, mm -hmm. what would you nominate as that one thing? Oh, I know exactly what I would nominate. And I thought I wasn't going to be able to answer this question when you started. I would, um, I would ask people to take 15 seconds, 30 seconds, to um, think of something that they feel grateful for, that has happened in their immediate history, right? That it's something mm -hmm. that it's either in, present in their lives right now or it happened today or yesterday, that they feel a sense of gratitude. For. I think that it will be gratitude that will create that compassion that we need to save our planet. What's the linkage? Why is gratitude so important? How does it link to compassion? Oh, well, um, it, a lot of ways, really. But I, And I started to talk a little bit about how our brains act as, as filters. So when we start to put our attention on the things that are actually are working in our lives, we become much more likely to create those things um, in our lives. And we become, our spirit just basically becomes more generous, right? So we get this sense of mm. um, power, actually, that we have um, influence over our world. And so to me, you know, compassion is recognizing suffering, but feeling that you have the power to alleviate that suffering. Mm. And so... And I think a lot of the um, damage that is, or the destruction in our world today comes from um, an insecurity or a lack of feelings of, you know, lack of control or that things, that when we feel like a victim, we're much more likely to be hurtful in our lives. So mm -hmm. gratitude can sort of transform, give us that personal power that we need to create positive things and also, you know, to feel compassion. For ourselves and for other people. That's great. Thank and you. And the earth. And the earth as well. And the earth. Well, yeah. Well, that's great, Christine. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. And uh, I really encourage people to check out your work. It's very grounded in science, very solid, and obviously uh, very evidently infused with life and heart and generosity and no bossiness. <laughs> um, and they can learn about this at christinecarter.com or raisinghappiness.com. Uh, and uh, I know that you're going to be working on new material always. So there's, you know, it's really great to go check out your work. So thank you very much for spending the time with us here. Uh, well, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, well, lots of fun, Rick. Thank you for having me. That's great. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.